Well, hello again, everyone. Uh, this is Bruce Erickson uh, with Purdue University Agronomy, and we're sure glad that you could join us again today for the next in our series. And you know what the series is all about, is that uh, we see great promise in using data to drive decisions in agriculture, but there's a lot that has to happen before that. We need to collect the data, we need to analyze it, visualize it, uh, and there's uh, all the various parts and pieces, and that could be with uh, crop management, forest management, soils, livestock, uh, food science, and all kinds of things. And so we're trying to cover the gamut here, and we're trying to, um, you know, while we're learning, we're hoping you're doing some learning too. And, and so, um, uh, and Megan, next slide, please. So um, just a word about uh, who we are and uh, some other places where you could get some information. If you're, um, you know, to, to log into this, you've probably seen the Digital Ag uh, website uh, that is associated uh, with this web series here. There's a great UAV site that uh, will complement today's discussion uh, from John Scott here that we'll start in just a, a little bit. You can see the website there. And uh, we appreciate uh, the support of the Wabash Heartland Innovation Network, win.org. So next. So, hey, we've done uh, 12 of these I was looking uh, at. And uh, if you missed uh, last week's or the weeks before, or even before that one, I, I don't know if last week's recording is up yet, but all the previous ones are. And uh, boy, there's some good ones. I've missed a couple and I went back and listened to the recordings. Uh, the one on data from uh, Nate DeLay here on April 1st was, uh, I thought, especially good. And uh, last week's, and, and they're all good, but um, we've got three more after this. Um, and then we'll finish out the spring series. I'm sure we'll be back uh, again in the future too. So uh, next, uh, a couple of uh, housekeeping things before I introduce John. And um, so, uh, turn off your camera. It'll save a little bandwidth. Uh, make sure that you're muted. And uh, if you do have questions, I'll be monitoring the chat room. And uh, I know John pretty well. I'm not afraid to butt in during John's presentation. And so we'll butt in if we have to, okay? And, and uh, we'll ask questions and we'll have a good time and maybe a little interaction too. So, and then at the end, what we always like to do, and Dennis is so good at this, is that uh, he, we open it up uh, and live mic kind of session here, just like you have downtown and, and uh, you can ask the questions live. So it's my pleasure now to uh, introduce uh, John Scott. And uh, John is a colleague of mine, and, and I work with John quite a bit. Uh, he, he works uh, with Wynn that I mentioned before here. And uh, he is the Extension Coordinator for Digital Agriculture, a Purdue grad from here, and uh, works uh, mostly in the uh, West Central Indiana area, but uh, works across the state too. And so uh, I'm anxious to hear an update on what uh, John has been up to and, and what he's been learning from his UAV flight. So John, take it away, please. All right, great. Thank you, Bruce. And thanks everyone for, for jumping on today. I'm gonna share my screen. All right, can you guys see that? Give me a thumbs up. All right, jump. Thanks, Bruce. I barely saw your thumb there, but thank you. Um, so yeah, like Bruce said, I'm John Scott. I'm the, the digital ag extension coordinator uh, focused mainly here in the wind region. So it's Tippecanoe and the surrounding counties is where I do most of my work uh, with the Wabash Heartland Innovation Network. Um, but I also do get out a little bit and, and work in other parts of the state and on other projects. Today, I, I do want to talk about practical applications for UAVs. And I'm going to really highlight some of the things that we've done in extension for that work. Um, so this isn't necessarily some of the theory and, and some of the things that we've talked about previously in this seminar series. Uh, this is things that actually folks in industry are using these tools for is what we're going to cover. Maybe. There we go. All right, so unmanned aerial vehicles. So UAV, UAS, SUAS, or drones. I, I'm gonna use all these terms most likely interchangeably just to get that piece of information out there. Um, the, like the federal government calls it an SUAS, so a small unmanned aerial system. That's what the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration calls these things and all of their publications. Um, but all these things take place in the industry. I'd say the biggest one by far when we're talking to producers and uh, other industry folks is drone. Everyone refers to these things as drones uh, or UAV. 
So in Purdue Agriculture, and this is really an extension, uh, we've got 24 extension educators now across the state of Indiana that have a UAV um, in their office. So if you take a look at the map here to the right, you can see where everybody's located. All these little um, boxes, I guess, with a little drone type thing in it. Those are actually where they're at. So I do most of my work here in this region. Um, I've got five educators in, in this region that I work with. My counterpart, Mark Carter, he's over in Blackford County. So he mans pretty much the rest of the state. I'm in charge of the Wynn region. He takes care of the other 86 counties. And we work quite a bit across the, the state to see what's going on and, and talk with folks. There are several camp, campus specialists that have these things that are doing things with them. Um, in agronomy, that would be Bob Nielsen and Sean Castile, and some of their grad students are doing work with it. Outside of that, I know there's some in turf, there's some in forestry, there's some in fruit production, or at least there used to be before uh, Dr. Borlon retired. So a lot of use, a lot of interest around what can this technology do from the, from the university. And the two coordinators are Mark and I. I do want to highlight again, uh, Bruce mentioned it and talked about the URL, and here it is again. But I do want to highlight the Purdue Extension UAV website. Um, if you guys take a look here, these are the use cases that we talk about. We're going to hit on some of the highlights on this. Um, but this is how we break it down, how we've broken it down. We've got animal agriculture, corn and soybean, diversified crops, marketing, natural resources, structural uses, and then turf. Uh, I do want to hit on the corn and soybean and diversified crops. At one point in time, that was all just crops. And we had enough stuff with corn and soybean being the, the two biggest commodity crops in Indiana that we felt the need to pull that out. But we also wanted to make sure that we talked about some of the uses in diversified crops. So we've got stuff in there with hemp. We've got stuff in there with strawberries and some fruit production, vegetable production, all those kinds of things that you wouldn't necessarily think about. Scale in Indiana, but how can we use the technology to help some of these niche areas? All right, so one of the, the big questions I get when I'm out and I, I give talks on these things is, okay, how much does it cost? And do I need to be commercially certified? That's probably the number, the, the, the two biggest questions I get. Usually, if you have to ask if you have to be commercially certified, the answer is yes, you probably need to be commercially certified. Um, so the way the FAA has that written, even today, they've changed the rules slightly, but the way it's written is you're a commercial operation if you derive any value from the product. So the picture that you take, if you derive any value from that, you're a commercial operation. So what I tell folks is I say, okay, if you take a picture of something and you go out and you hang it on your wall and you just sit back in your chair and just look at that picture and say, boy, that's just a, a nice picture. Okay, that's not commercial. But if you put that picture on social media and you use that to promote your operation, now you're commercial. Money doesn't have to change hands in order to be commercial, okay? So nine times out of 10 and everything that we're gonna talk about in this talk and most uses in agriculture, you're going to fall into that commercial category and need to be certified. So in order to do that, you need to know what the requirements are for that and that's through the FAA. So again, the Federal Aviation Administration, they are the ones that regulate the airspace in the United States. So know their requirements. You have to take and pass the uh, remote pilot test. So that part 107 is what denotes what the remote pilot is. Um, that's just a 60 question multiple choice test. So it's ABC and you go through and you take the test. If you pass with a 70% or higher, then you, you become certified. If you don't have 70%, um, then you'd have to retake the test. I think the wait period is 14 days still. Um, that test is 160 bucks right now to take for the initial exam. And if you know nothing about aviation and rules and regulations of an aviation, how an airport works, how an airplane operates, it's going to take some time to study and, and prepare for this. What we do have an extension, we actually have a, a course that we put together a couple of years ago to help people get ready for their initial exam, just to learn those things um, that we cater mostly to the, the agriculture industry. And we're starting to talk to uh, law enforcement and EMA people as well 
so that they can understand how they can use the technology in their areas and also become certified. What you also need to do once you pass the test and you can become certified, you fill all the paperwork, then you need to decide what are your needs for your farm management strategy. So what do you, how's the technology fit for you? What are you gonna do with it before you can just go out there and spend a bunch of money? Because quite honestly, you can spend a lot of money on these things. And if you don't have a plan, it's just gonna sit there and be a paperweight. So once you've figured out kind of, hey, this is what I wanna do with it, you develop a budget, so you can fit that and then you select the drone, the sensors or the software that makes sense for how you wanna use it. Uh, you might need a $10,000 drone if that's kind of the strategy then how you wanna go about it. But you might be able to get by with a $1,500 drone too. It all depends on, on what your needs and, and things are. And the last piece there is the get insurance. Um, a lot of people I think kind of forget about that but you need liability insurance because if you don't have it and the thing falls out of the sky, you're on the hook for that. You're the, the they call it the RPIC, so the remote pilot in command. If that's who you are and you're the one operating that drone, it belongs to you and you're responsible for it in all facets. So here's how it kind of breaks down. Um, so the remote pilot test, it's $150. And this is actually needs to be updated. So in some places, it's still 150, some it's 160 and then Every two years is not the case anymore. It's 150 or 60 for the initial. And then the recurrent, this just changed. I think it just took effect yesterday. Every two years you can do the recurrent um, and it's free now. And it's just a, an online kind of a continuing education type course. But you still have to do that every two years. Previously, you had to pay it again and, and reset and take the test again. The drone registration, so all these drones have to be registered with the FAA and they have to have a registration number on the outside of them. Um, that's $5 a drone. And I think that's good for three years is the, the duration of that. But the drone itself, I've got on there, you know, 500 to $10,000 for, for most drones. The 500 might be a little bit low now um, for a good quality ag drone. 10,000 is, is ballpark of the higher end, but you could easily go out there and spend fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 if you wanted to, if, if you could justify it. Most of them are gonna be in that around uh, $1,500 to $3,000 range. So your drone supplies, all the extra stuff and everything else you need to keep the, keep the machine operational. Uh, you have to have extra batteries. Most of them will come with one. One battery for most of these things will get you 20 to 30 minutes of flight time. That's enough to cover about 100 acres, maybe 130. So it's, it's enough to get quite a bit done, but it's not enough to actually go out there and get a lot of work done and, and really see the return on investment for the value of the machine. So you're gonna have a little extra cost in that. Cameras, I've got here on the year zero to 8,000. Uh, zero being, if you say, hey, I'm good with the stock camera that the drone comes with, fantastic. You don't have to spend more money. But if you need to upgrade that, that sensor and have more, capability. If you want to do NDVI or you want to do NDRE, those are going to be additional sensors and cost more money. Or if you want to do thermal as well. So I say on the top end, you're probably about eight grand on that, but that could easily be higher, easily be higher, depending on how many sensors you're going to purchase. The liability insurance is definitely variable. It depends on how that's going to be covered, uh, whether you go through just a drone provider, if you try to work it into existing liability insurance as a farm operation. Data storage, so once you take all these pictures and we get all this stuff, you've got to put it somewhere. You've got to do something with it. And a lot of times, if you just try to put it on your computer, you're going to generate so much that you could fill the machine pretty quick. And you're going to need a way to not do that. So you can still use the machine. So like we've got uh, external hard drives is what we use, but you could also use cloud-based stuff and put it on there. But a lot of times that's going to have cost eventually. So then your load high total, I said it would be 16, around 1,600 up over 20,000 plus insurance with the average being uh, around 45, 4,600 plus insurance. And I think that still holds up pretty well today um, by the time you get all the bells and whistles. So just to buy the straight drone with the drone supplies, uh, not worrying about extra cameras or the data storage, I tell most folks you're looking at about $3,000. You could buy a nice Phantom 4 Pro 
for 1500 or Mavic 2 for 1500. Those are both DJI products. Uh, most of our producers are going to buy that because they still control about 80% of the market. And that'll get you that plus the iPad and the batteries. So you can get by for, for that 225 to $3,000. So John, a quick question here for you go yeah. on. Uh, are, 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 are most of these uh, bought online or is there like a drone superstore that people go to or how's that work? Drones are yeah. us. Drone superstore. Uh, <laughs> they're actually, you bring that up. There are some companies that do do that online um, that they, they sell drones commercially. Um, and agriculture, when I talk to a lot of producers, a lot of them get them through their, their seed partnerships. So they're either the co-op or their seed dealer. I mean, that's where they're getting a lot of those from here in, in the local area. Uh, you could go to like a big box store and buy one if you wanted to. Yeah. Um, so who, you can get them about everywhere, but I'd say most of our producers are probably getting them through their seed or their, their chem representatives. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Yep. So that's the background stuff I wanted to hit on. Now we're going to get into some of these practical uses. Um, so I've got imagery, of the big two. So there's big, there's two big types of imagery. There's manual flights where we fly around just freehand and we take pictures and video of things out in the field. And then there's planned flights where we would stitch an image together. Okay. So those are the, the big two driving things and the two different ways of looking at it. Manual flights don't cost anything. Okay. I mean, you, you have the cost of the drone and everything, but there's no additional software for a manual flight. That's all built in. If you do a stitch flight, a planned flight, where you're going to make a map, then there's additional costs for the software, for the algorithms and to put all that stuff together. So most producers and a lot of other folks in different industries aren't going to stitch an image together. They're going to just go with the manual stuff. It's still pretty valuable. Uh, here's a video. Let's see if it plays. Here's a video showing a 360 of a field. This is a bean field. So just take a look. So what we did is we went to the center of the field and we just rotated. You can see right there's a spot, kind of windy this day. See the beans changing. Right here, if we look, see that pattern in here. So those beans are actually starting to lay over. Uh, in order to really tell that, we had to get down lower um, to, to see that. But you can see, you know, 24 second video, that's a 50 acre field. So we were already able to tease out one spot we want to check out and another spot in the back of the field where it looks like they're probably laying over. We'd have to fly down a little bit closer and look at that or actually walk out and look at it. Um, but there's something up. There's something up. So manual flights like this are great for scouting. I don't know how many folks have walked a field before. I've walked fields. I've walked this field. And you cannot walk 50 acre fields in 24 seconds. It's not possible. You're not going to do it, especially in August when the beans are hip high. You know, walking that field and doing a good job, you're going to have an hour at least trying to get through it. 24 seconds, it's in, you just can't beat it. Just can't beat it. Here's a photo. This is just a still shot from that same field. In this case, we flew to the northwest quadrant. And you can see that there's that waterway that we saw. And there's something different right in this area. So it's circled to, to kind of pull it out to you. But if you look real close, you can see the vegetation in here is a slightly different color, just a slightly different color. And this was, we were able to see this from the field edge flying the drone. Everything else is that kind of uniform green around it, we would expect in the beans. We've got some different colors here and here and over here, probably soil differences. Uh, there's a wash cob right here. So it's probably some uh, drainage as well. But that right there stuck out because it's too small to be most likely soil and it just looks odd. So we're able to kind of detect that anomaly just visually. And then we fly down and sure enough, we've got a weed escape. So in this case, we've got uh, water hemp that, that popped up late. If we go back to this last image. There's a little bit of a rise right here. Again, this is a wasp up. There's a little bit of a rise right here. So we couldn't see that water hemp from the road just driving up and down the road. So we would have missed this. Uh, that would not, have, that would have gone ahead and gone to seed and we would have ran the combine through it and had a mess. As it was, we were able to get out there and this is one of mom and dad's fields. And we sent my brother out there with a bean hook and he was able to hole him out. 
and we're able to kill that and, and control that weed pressure from being a problem for next year. Keep that weed bank down. The last piece, when we took that last picture, it also dropped a point. So this is the geo reference point, the lat long of where that weed, that water hemp weed was at in the field. So we could say, okay, hey, here's, here's where it is. Not only do we have the picture, but here is the point that you need to walk to to kill that problem. And that's just weed detection. I mean, you could do similar stuff with disease or uh, insect detection as well, as long as you can visually see it. So here's planned flights. Got a video here we'll play. So it's actually building a planned flight. This is using drone deploy, which is the one we use. So we set our height to 400 feet. That's the, the legal ceiling. And right now we're putting in the boundaries. So the blue box is the boundary. So that's the field boundary. And then the green line is the, the actual flight path that the drone's going to fly as it covers that field. So we've got seven, seven minutes and 43 seconds, how long it'll take to fly this roughly. It's about 41 acres. It should take around 95 images and it'll take one battery. Name the field, I'm gonna switch to advanced. Here in a minute, turn the live map on and off. So here's where we're setting the side lap and the front lap. So this is the overlap for how these images are gonna be stacked up. So if you look, as we increase the, the side lap there, the green lines get thicker. So they get closer together. So what that's doing is it's just making it a more dense uh, image cloud. And the front lap is gonna trigger how often it takes pictures on the line as it travels across the field. So an 80-80 overlap, um, the only time I would usually use an 80-80 overlap like this would be in corn in July uh, or a post tassel because I need that tighter overlap because for some reason, and I don't know why, Corn has a harder time stitching once it's gotten tasseled. I think it has something to do with how much it reflects. But if you have an 80 80 overlap, it seems like it can still stitch. Whereas with beans, you can get by with a lower overlap. Now here it's just flying. So at this point in time, myself as the operator would not be controlling anything. I'm not touching the sticks. The machine, the, the drone itself is doing all the flight here. So we've taken them 12, 13, 14. There's the pictures are going up or at 400 feet. We're traveling at 21 miles per hour. And then the, the, this home point, that's how far away it is from where it took off. And then the elapsed time. The battery life as well, in this case, since it's a simulation, uh, it's just gonna stay at 75%, but that will slowly drop over time. So you can kind of understand like, okay, how much longer can I fly or before it comes back home? And it's also set to automatically return home. It hits a threshold in the battery and it'll come back and, and land. And then you just change the battery out and you push the button and it goes again. So this piece is, is fully automated pretty much. Basically, once you set up your, your front lap and your side lap and you're happy with that, you push two buttons and you're airborne and you don't touch the sticks the whole time. So here's what you can do with that. If we, can, we flew it. We brought the data back, we uploaded the pictures, and we got these ortho mosaics back. And this is a time series starting in early August through uh, late September. So we flew this field periodically. One thing that you notice here, green, not, not green. Really, really not green, okay? And then here we can see where the canopies failed so what this is in this case, and we had to go out and uh, walk it to really identify, but this is disease. So we had gray leaf spot in that particular hybrid. This is a hybrid trial at Ivy Tech here in Lafayette. And this is gray leaf spot that just hammered that particular hybrid. And then here's some plant health images. So this, in this case, it's a very map. So visible atmospherically resistant index is what that is. And how that works is it takes the RGB and you run it through an algorithm and it creates this false color map. Some people call it false NDVI. It's not actually false NDVI um, because it's, it's very, it's a, it's a whole different index. But you can see that here as well. Um, when we saw that disease pressure coming in, it lit this up bright red, bright red. So, so John, it, this is something that uh, if a producer had not been paying attention until harvest, 
um, they would have harvested the strip trial and just noted that that particular hybrid just really did poorly. Yeah. Um, but now yep. you've got a reason why it did poorly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. So we can detect that early in season and know what happened. Um, and when we, I don't think I've got it in here, but when we went out there and looked at this field, um, actually pulled back the, uh, the corn between this one and the one right next to it that was better. So these two are fairly close in maturity. This one just had the gray leaf spot and this one didn't. Pulled them back and looked at them. The one with the gray leaf spot had black layered. And the other one still had about two weeks, two or three weeks of seed fill. So, but it all relates back to that disease. Whereas, like you said, you know, there was definitely a yield drop, Bruce. We, we monitored that. But without going out there and seeing it, we would never would have known why did it yield poorly. Yeah, you just might have thought it was just a dud hybrid or something. But uh, mm -hmm. here's a question from Bill in the chat. Uh, how did you make the NDVI alternative map? I... So um, I didn't. The machines did. <laughs> the algorithm did. Um, so it, the way that very works is it takes the RGB, so your red, green, blue, uh, from your visible, and how it works basically is we know plants are green because they're green so they reflect a lot of green light but they also reflect a little bit of red and a little bit of blue not as much obviously as green or they'd be those colors but we know what that is so based on that knowledge we can say okay this is how much it reflected this color this color and this color they can run that those values through an algorithm to create this map and and this index was actually came out of the university of nebraska in the 2000s so it's a relatively new index. Um, and I think on the next one, we actually look at some NDBIs too, or we've got some here in a little bit, but that's how that's done. It just runs through the algorithm. And this is a particular algorithm that they already have written into the software used to stitch. So, um, planned flights, looking at satellite airplane and UAVs. Uh, so we've got a satellite here uh, airplane in the middle, and then a UAV ortho mosaic at the end. This was all done by Mark Carter. So these three fields are all the exact same field. Um, the satellite came from FieldView. They had a subscription to that on his farm. And this was an infield advantage airplane flight. And then the UAV Mark himself flew. So if you guys look here, you can see quite a bit of difference in some of these images. One of them with the satellite that jumps out to me at first is we don't have the resolution. So you don't see near the detail that you see in the airplane or the UAV images. In the UAV images, you can see this striping through the field, probably a plug knife. Um, they just didn't get enough nitrogen, I would assume. Could be other things, but that's, I've seen that pattern before and that's usually what it is. You see it in the airplane image, but we just don't have that resolution, that good high quality resolution in satellite to, to tease that out. And then we'll look at the, the plant health. So we've got an NDVI from satellite, the airplane NDVI, and then this is a vary from the UAV. So this is a different algorithm, right? These two are the same and this one's different, but we can still kind of get a feel for what's going on in those fields. So, you know, that's kind of the, the background on imagery. So, you know, which one's best for you? You know, cost will be the biggest driving factor for sure. So what can I afford? How much am I gonna use it? All these types of questions. So the big question is, can I consider drones to be useful technology or is it pure hype? That, that's a big thing and it depends on the operation and it depends on the level of technology that someone wants to, to use and how much they embrace it. For some folks, it might be enough just to use a satellite and that tells them enough detail that, that it works. Some might say, hey, I want that higher resolution. I want to see exactly down to, you know, sub inch in cases with the UAV. And that's fine. Some people might not be interested in the, the plant health map or any of the maps. They just want to do it as a scouting tool. That's, that's fine. Um, it really boils down to, to how much someone's going to use it. What I don't want to see when I talk to producers is them go out and spend a bunch of money on something that is just a paperweight. Because that doesn't make sense for anybody. So transitioning into some of the specific use cases, we've got some imagery with row crops here. So here's an example of corn lodging. 
Um, and this is an interesting field. We've got, as you can see here, different hybrids. Uh, and these are definitely different hybrids. Uh, we check that. We've got water here. So they're broken tile in this field, in this case. And you can see one of the hybrids did not like having wet feet. And one of them didn't seem to mind it too much. So how does this use? Who cares? What does this matter? Well, if you're having a conversation with the producer, or if you're a producer yourself trying to figure out what, when should I harvest what, as soon as that gets dry enough, you probably want to be harvesting this field before they all fall over. And you have to go out there with a the reel and try to pick them up. So that's one thing that we can see here. But if you look, here's the road, here's the highway. We've got two passes, it looks like, of end rows, and they're all standing fine. So we wouldn't know that these were all falling over until we were ready to harvest, unless we actually walked out in there, which you're probably not going to do. We're being honest with ourselves. And we wouldn't see it without the UAB. Here's a good example. This is from Davis. Jeff Boyer got this. Can you guys see these lines? We got lines running this way vertically, north and south. And then these horizontal lines, especially down here, running east and west. This is soybeans and this is corn. And here's the, the plant health. This is also a very. These are tile lines. Okay, these are these are field tile lines. And what's interesting to me about this is these north-south tile lines, they were put in, in in 2010. They're plastic. These east-west ones, these were put in the 1960s and they're concrete. So we can not only see visually the, the newer lines, the newer drainage systems, we can also see some of these older legacy lines as well. Now, now time of year is pretty important. Soil moisture is also pretty important to see these things pop. Um, we're still trying to kind of play with it and figure out like when is the best time and, and the best conditions, but we can do this and we can map this and understand like, okay, here's the soil, here's the tile map. So maybe we want to think about where do we put the next piece of tile in at, or, or do we even need to? Are the systems working okay? It's also kind of neat. Uh, I've seen some when they're not working, uh, you just, you can see the tile lines and you can see where it, it's like, well, that one's plugged because there's nothing there and it's, it looks wet, especially in the spring. You can see the soil color differences in a lot of cases where it's just wetter there. And this hopefully will help answer that last question with NDVI and NDRE, um, the plant health stuff. So this is an example where we've gotten these two images are from just the the stock camera on a Phantom 4 Pro, the RGB, so your natural color and your vary. And then these two, we use a different camera, a different sensor. In this case, it was a double 4K from Sentara. And that, that's what it used to cost. I'm not sure if this is what it's up to now, but it's probably around there still. So a little over $3,000 to get an NDVI and an NDRE. Um, so you guys can take a look at it right here and see this is what these, these different things can give us. So NDVI and NDRE uses red and uh, near infrared, whereas Vera uses just the RGB. Okay. So, you know, obviously there's some similarities between these four maps. These were all taken at the exact same time with the same drone. One thing that I've had folks point out to me and they're not wrong, they're correct. This here, if we look on this edge, here and here, it's still got that green color. Whereas the very, you see where it's a shade redder. Now, if we look here, if you look real close, you can see this is just a slightly different color than this. In this case, I don't believe that's real. I think that's a, a, a glitch in the camera, uh, maybe a glitch in the settings of the camera. It could have been auto automatic settings instead of a manual or, or something like that. It could have been the way it was reflecting off the, with the sunlight as the, as the sun was coming up in the morning. Could have been any number of things. I don't think that is correct um, based on my experience flying these things and knowing what this field looked like before and after, the week before and the week after. I think that's just a trick of the optics. So I think this is probably the most correct map, this NDVI using that different sensor in this case. But what I ask producers is, okay, is it, different enough to justify spending an additional $3,000.
you spent three grand, 2,500, three grand on just this, is it worth another, is it worth the cost of the drone again? Do you get that much better of an image with this sensor versus what you can get just with the stock? And that's up for, for those producers. Some say, yeah, it is, that's what I want. And some say, you know what? No, I, I don't believe that to be the case. And that's why we show this stuff. That's why we've done the work we've done with these different sensors to, to really drive home the point of where does it make the most sense for a producer? Most producers, I will say, if they're doing this, are sticking with just these two maps. That's the, what the majority of those folks are doing today. Whereas your uh, retailers, a lot of them will go ahead and make the jump into one of these. Um, they'll keep these as well, but they'll make the jump into to one or the other of these. In some cases, both as well. So here's that uh, case study. So this is a neat one. We, we actually took it up and, and filmed them as they were applying swine manure uh, side dressed onto the field. So we were able to document, document the actual application. We were looking at uh, the fall applied side dress and the V4. So this is, um, or the V4 side dress. So this, this map, these maps, is what this looked like in real life. So this was late July, this was late August. So you can see that again. And this again, this isn't mapping. We're not mapping this. This is just taking a still shot and looking at it and seeing what's going on. Here's the map from late July. And then we actually went out and walked the field and looked at things. Here's the V4 side dress. Here's the fall applied swine manure. You can tell that's me right there. And this is Adam Shank. So you can tell kind of the height differences. And then we also looked at the inside, cut them and looked at the inside of the, the stalks to kind of see, okay, which one looking the most healthy. In this case, you see that color you like to see on those corn plants kind of seeping in there, whereas this one doesn't have it quite as much. We're able to tease all this stuff out using the drone as a tool, but then we still had to get in the field and actually look at things and say, okay, what's happening? What's going on? So we can bring it home and, and say, okay, what is the whole story in this field? All right, so crops spraying and spreading. Uh, this is a DJI Agris, is what this is. In this case, underneath there, it has a the spreader attachment. This thing can also spray things. So you could put an herbicide or a pesticide of some sort into the, the spray tank and it can spray it on. It'll hold, I think, two and a half gallon is what it'll hold. Uh, as far as the spreader, it'll hold, I think it's ready to hold 22 kilograms. Of a product. You can spread fertilizer or seed. In this case, we were actually spreading seed into um, soybeans. We were spreading a cover crop of clover into some soybeans. This is a different example using that. This is out at Ivy Tech. We used it as well to spread a cereal rye and vetch and also cereal rye and clover. So we've got these red lines. So this right here in the middle is where the cover crop was spread with the drone. This was a uh, interseed in, I think they did it in June before this, the plants got too tall. So the previous June, this was applied in September. And then this over here was drilled after the, the corn came off. So you can see the differences um, from the air where it was applied. And then we got down here a little bit lower. So right here's the middle. This side here, where you can see some of that vegetation a little denser, that was where it was flown on with the drone. Over here, this is drilled after harvest. So this was flown on through drone um, there in that September window, late September. So it's a lot thicker on the drone side than what it was after the, uh, after the crop was often drilled. However, if we look at the inner seed compared, so the inner seeds on this side, and this over here is the, the drone applied. So the inner seed that had that was put in in the summer had a more time, more better seed to soil contact. It got going very well, whereas the drone stuff still came up, still was competitive, but definitely not near as as what we'd like to see as, as dense as this. But I think it still has its uses, uh, especially in areas where you can't get into very easily with equipment. If you don't have the equipment to do it, 
Um, it's, in some cases, it's probably even cheaper than getting it flown on, and you can have a little bit more control about your application window and, and rate. Livestock, we've got pasture management. This was flown by uh, Dave Osborne down in Ripley County, working with Dr. Keith Johnson on different seeding rates and different, uh, or not seeding rates, but different forage types. Um, this is done at Fielden. So what they did is they had different paddocks. So we've got paddock one, two, three, and four. And the cattle, I think, was a handful of heifers. They were released into one paddock. And then after a few days, they opened it up and let them into the next paddock and the next paddock and the next paddock without any back fencing. So they could go back and forth across the pasture. If you even look here, you can start teasing out that there was definitely some preferential selection from those cattle. And it really pops, I think, when we look at the, the plant health map. Um, what was interesting to me as a, a guy on the crop side is, in this case, red is generally good. Uh, whereas in crops, red is bad. You don't want to see a red area of the field because it means you've got disease pressure, insect pressure, you've got something going on. Here, it means you had better grazing in, in most cases. So that's what they, they tended to eat more of. We're seeing that and they tended to shy away from these, these areas. The drawback to that is if they overgraze it, of course, you could have also the potential for weed pressure coming in. So if it was overgrazed in some of these areas where they prefer preferentially selected it, you might be concerned about potential weed pressure coming in. Um, and we're able to kind of tease all that stuff out again from the air. On the ground, you would have seen these big areas for sure where they didn't do it, but teasing out the differences through here would have been much more problematic. So roofing. So here's tearing off the, the old shingles off a roof. So getting up there and taking a look at that. This is papering. And the last one is the shingling aspect. So in this case, we flew it. Uh, this gets into some of the, the marketing stuff. I uh, worked with a roofer. They were wanting to, to take a look at some of these things and just kind of say, okay, how are these guys doing it? What's going on? Um, what's the process? And they're going to use it for some marketing stuff. So that's just an example of, of that. In this case, this is another roof that we looked at. And they had gotten struck by lightning. This house had been struck by lightning. It was a very expensive build. And so they said, okay, can we get up there and take a look at it? Because this is a pretty steep roof too. Can we get up there and take a look at it with the drone and see do we need, if we need to send a person up there? A, and B, can we identify and get some imagery of where those things might be if we need to turn it in for the insurance? So that was a, a pretty neat use of of the technology that's definitely not inside of ag, but still shows the merits of it. Turf, we've got, this was done uh, at Rensselaer High School, looking at the different turf at, over the season. One thing I will say is, I think the one here in September, you can see this brown on the outside and it's red. So that was showing up, you did, they couldn't see it on the ground or they didn't, because um, we talked to the groundskeepers. But once they saw it here, they were able to kind of change how they irrigated and get that field pulled back to where it needed to be, where they wanted it to be for the games. So they were able to, to irrigate that a little bit more and help take care of the problem. One of the neat projects we did was with uh, Purdue Athletics. We looked at Ross Aid. So we did some, some preseason stuff and we also followed it kind of through the, the game, you know, the, the football season. So here's the preseason map. Everything looks, looks great. And then after the first game, even after the first game, you can see where we've gotten some, some wear and tear, especially here kind of in the middle on this very map. So here's the second home game and the third home game. So we've still got that spot. It's kind of starting to pick up here some and over here a little bit as well. In this case, we've got these lines here. That's because of the shadows from the, from the lights. That was a, kind of an unfortunate thing. But you can still see some of these wear patterns. And what the, the folks in athletics did is they took these maps 
and they would look at them and it helped them kind of determine, hey, where do we need to go out onto the field and do we need to paint something or we need to put plugs in or what do we need to do to help better manage what we're seeing and where the wear and the tear is on the field. So, John, I'm hoping this fall that there's a lot more wear and tear by the Purdue <laughs> goalposts as opposed to the opposing team. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So maybe you'll detect that too. And I, I know it switches back and forth, but I hope. I hope. Uh, here's a soccer field at Rossville. Uh, what was neat about this? And I actually, I, I took, I flew it with the FFA and I took this and some of the kids played soccer and we were talking about what we're seeing here. And when they practice, this is the Rossville side. This is the visiting team side. So when they practice, they tend to practice mostly on this side of the field where we're seeing more of the wear pattern. Also, they practice at this um, I don't know what you call that in soccer, net. They tend to practice on this net more so than this net. So we're seeing that pattern where they've got this running up and down to this net because what they'll do is they'll come on here, and they'll go from midfield, and they'll kick the ball when they're doing their drills. So we're seeing the, actually the foot traffic from the soccer players um, as, the, as they practice for their games. It was really interesting. The thing is, too, on the ground, and even really on this image, you don't see that. You don't see that near as well. You can tease out, like, a circle's not a perfect circle. Uh, we've got some mowing differences where they – looks like they just make a big circle and they mow. But you don't see those wear patterns nearly as well as what you do here. And you didn't see any of that on the ground. So the last piece I've got here is just kind of a quick overview of marketing. Um, and how that's done. So you, you can use this technology to market a business, you know, take a picture of a house, you can use it to, to sell real estate, move real estate. It's getting bigger and bigger, I'd say, in the real estate market, especially now with prices where they are and, and homes are flying out the door. So they'll take these up and get some of those images to, to market those pieces. Uh, harvest operation, so you can take neat pictures of, of harvests you can take neat pictures of planting, spraying, any operation on the, on the farm. You can take some neat pictures of and use that for marketing that business and trying to talk to people about why, why does your farm operation matter? And not just row crops. I mean, that's getting to be a bigger thing, I think, even in the agritourism type side of things. If we can get it up there, we can take some neat pictures of, of the crowds and what's going on and really try to sell our operation. So with that, I think I'm done. Well, John, there's a couple there's a couple questions, comments in the queue, and as we said at the beginning, um, uh, if if you want to unmute and and just go ahead and ask your question, don't worry about interrupting me. Just please start talking. Uh, otherwise, um, I'm going to ask a couple questions, and I was just going to comment on that last slide. There's some really fantastic uh, harvesting. Um, videos on YouTube of, of uh, there's lots of them of farm stuff that taken with UAVs. Um, some really talented people out there that I, I've used in class and that kind of thing. So and any, anyone want to, anyone want to unmute and ask their question? Uh, John, thanks yeah. for the presentation. Uh, I'm Jin Hajang from uh, Life School of Civil Engineering. And uh, actually I've been working on this UAV based high to phenotyping project for the last six years, I'm going to say. And I'm going to say that most you know, the breeders in you know, the research application, I think that this UAV is kind of becoming a, you know, very, very safe tools. But uh, I don't know much about actually in you know, the grower side. So what do you see as a kind of biggest uh, you know, barrier for growers to adopt this kind of technology? Yeah, um, I, I think one of the biggest barriers and, and one of the biggest questions I get from them is the return on investment and, and really being able to see and, and derive value from this technology for, for their operation and, and seeing that value, right? Um, when I talk to a lot of producers, especially the ones that are kind of on the fence about it, I don't, I usually say don't go out and buy one. I mean, that's my advice to them when they ask for it. 
I say, you know, what I would do if I was you is I'd pick a field, 100 acre field, say, and talk to your co-op because they'll have them or your, your seed representative and have them fly it for you, have them map it for you. If you find value in that, you see yourself looking at that map over time, then, you know, you can appreciate and see the value in it. But there's no sense in going out there and spending thousands of dollars when it might just be a paperweight. So those that do that, I think that that hire it out from their, their local retailers, if they see the value, they go ahead and buy it. And if they don't, they either continue to buy it off of their retailers or they say, that's, that's not for me right now. Okay, uh, the, the reason why I'm asking, I think uh, Songlin is uh, in this room and uh, as well, but um, uh, one of my, you know, the, my research groups in you know, the focus area is a centralized uh, online platform for UAB data management and data processing and sharing all those kind of stuff. So do you think that having an open platform where anybody can come and actually process the data and manage them, you know, do you think that, that will kind of um, encourage you know growers to adopt this kind of technology because you know once they collect the data you know now they're going to be an open platform where they can actually unload it and process it and uh, visualize it you know right away and uh, you know what kind of platform do you use to process UAV data? Mm -hmm. uh, to answer the first question yes I think so I mean that's one of the barriers to entry is the cost of the software to, to do the stitching because uh, a lot of them are interested in I mean, the big thing, and I hear it all the time, is, you know, how do I process an NDVI map? Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, but, but it costs money to do that, right? Um, especially if the question is, is it valuable to me or isn't it? What we use in extension usually is, uh, for the most part, is drone deploy to do our processing. Um, some of the research I know, and we're looking at it as well, is PIX4D. Um, some of the guys that are doing some of the heavier research are using, I think, EarDOS um, as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, John, in the chat here, just a comment from Bill saying back on the tile lines um, that um, said they use plane-based imagery and found them within five to ten days of a half to one inch rain. And I'm assuming that's on bare soil. I know you can do that. Um, you can see them on bare soil, too. Uh, mm -hmm. Pretty good. And... Um, so um, let me ask another one and then we can take a, a comment. Um, what, what about, um, okay, so you did that 40 acres um, with, on one battery. And so let's just say that I have like 5,000 acres of crops. I mean, which is a fairly, for a few thousand, that's a kind of common thing. Right. Um, isn't this like an extraordinarily work intensive amount of effort to like, look at all your fields? And, and, and what about battery life? Is it is like in the future, is battery life? This Juan, Juan asked the question, yeah. is that getting better? Um, I addressed the battery life one first. Uh, yeah, I think the battery life is getting better. Um, and that also, when I was talking about that, I mean, that's for a multi-rotor. So a quadcopter, if you will, or a, so like the Phantom 4 that we use. They have some of the fixed wings that you can, they'll stretch them out 45 minutes to an hour um, on their battery life. If you're just looking to map, you're straight up map fields. Um, the, the Quantix that we use, it's an air environment Quantix. It'll cover, I think like 350 or 400 acres in 45 minutes. So you can get a lot of real estate done covered with that, but it's also, it's just gonna take pictures and map the field. It's not gonna give you the video or the, the manual flight. You, you can't do both. Um, as far as, you know, right now with the technology we've got, the battery life since it originally was, has gotten much better, I will say. But right now, the, the biggest, the best way to do it for us, for the technologies that we have is you, you have to manage that. It's something you have to watch, keep an eye on and manage your batteries to the best of your ability. And sometimes it, it involves making choices quite honestly, and you have to choose, you know, do I fly the extra pass or don't I based on my batteries? Um, and, you know, you're, you're always switching between how much battery do I have and how much ground do I need to cover and, and what do my overlaps need to be and how much resolution do I want to see in my map? Yeah. Okay, uh, go ahead, Solang. 
Hey, John, I just said uh, one quick comment on that uh, battery thing. I, I, I do know that like the, with the aviation technology, they have uh, experimenting some of the fixed wing stuff uh, <laughs> that you can get up to two hours in the air that have, you know, great uh, uh, coverage with some multi-sensors. So the technology is available. Um, I have a question, John. I think you know Jing Ha is uh, somewhat already uh, uh, get this, but I, um, what is the current uh, user base and how much demand do we have? Um, and the, the, the second question I have is um, currently how how the data is being you know as if did that there just you you take the picture sit on the sd card and then you erase it later or, or what is the current practice that you know people can use um so i'm gonna try make sure i understand your question uh, so the your question the first thing is uh, let's start with the first one what is okay. the current how, how popular is this how much demand that you have all right so the popularity, um, a lot of producers are curious about it. I will say that. I mean, it's one thing that they're very curious about it. They ask a lot of questions about it. They they want to. They're interested. They're not necessarily running over each other to go buy them um, by any means. I would say we have more in our area, the area that I work in. We have more buy-in from industry. Uh, from the retailers and the seed folks, uh, the agronomists, the crop consultants, folks that are running that side of the business, there's a lot more interest um, in that, and it's a lot more popular for those folks than it is for the individual producer. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, so even that group, they don't really necessarily have the software and capacity to process in the data themselves, do they? they don't. No. A lot of them are going to still outsource it, um, and that you know the one of the biggest, the big two in Indiana that we see um, as far as produce or uh, analyzing the data would be Drone Deploy and Centera, using their field agent. Um, the reason why is they don't. A lot of the folks, quite frankly, don't have time to sit there and, and produce it. A, B, they're not. GIS experts. I mean, they're, they're not analytics experts. You know, I want to throw it in here. It does its thing and it gives me the information I need to make a decision to help that guy run his business. Um, those are the two constraints I would say for most of those folks is they just don't have the, the skills and the expertise to yeah. sit there and crunch it themselves. Exactly. And so the second question that is like, even for like you, you guys, uh, the, the regional offices, um, if someone asks, what does, does my field look like you flow uh, last year, you do not necessarily have the capacity to withdraw uh, that information from your old drive to do that, right? Actually, I, I would. Okay, so you guys do store them in some fashion. Yeah, yep. So when I fly a field for somebody, I store, uh, like me personally, I store all the images I took um, on my hard drive. And then I store, I upload it to Drone Deploy, so they store a local, or I store a copy on the cloud. And then ideally, I try to share all the raw data, all the raw images back to whoever I flew with, so they can do with it however they want, as far as I'm concerned. So we should have it in triplicate. The drone Deploy is not cheap, though. How much are you paying for that service? Uh, well, um, I'm in charge of the Purdue Enterprise account. And um, so we've got 28 users on that, and we're paying around 30,000 <laughs> um, for all those users. So now it's more expensive that. than that. We can get the money from that, and then we can provide the service to you know, anybody in Indiana. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I just want to make a quick comment about, uh, you know, Bruce's question about, you know, better life. I, I don't think a better life is an issue here. Because you know, before these you know UAVs comes in with all the batteries, we have a gas engine that can fly tens of hours without any problem. So in terms of technology, you know, being able to cover that, you know, less ten thousand acre, we can do it on UAV. But the problem is in you know, FAA regulation where we cannot fly out of line of sight. 
So I don't, I'm not going to say that it's not because of the technology we can fly that in a big of area with the UAVs, but because of regulation that we have right now. Okay, great discussion. And I hate to cut it off, but I'm going to need to here. Uh, you're welcome to follow up with John, I think on his last slide, if I'm yeah. not, uh, he had his email there. And um, so, um, yeah, if you can bring that up quickly yep. then. And then, um, yeah, Scott42. That's me. And um, so, Megan, if you could bring up the last slide. And just a reminder, uh, just want to thank John Scott again for an excellent presentation and those people that uh, made comments and questions as excellent dialogue here at the end. Uh, and we'll be back uh, again next week and the week after that uh, and the week after that uh, for our spring webinar series. Uh, next week is IoT networks and uh, artificial intelligence, IoT, uh, all the machine learning. There's, a, there's a, a lot of topics we can talk about in digital agriculture, but uh, thank you everyone and appreciate uh, your participation and uh, we'll see you all again next time. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you, John.